Morning, everybody. I apologize, but for whatever reason this morning when I woke up, my throat decided, yeah, we're going to be sore today. Awesome. I always love when that happens. But hey, at least it wasn't laryngitis. So, so Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. 2022, here we are, right? 2021, somebody hit the fast forward button on us, I think. That's what it felt like to me, at least, when we were going through and all of a sudden, now I got to remember to put the right number on my checks again. I was just getting used to 21, now we're on 22. So, But we're at that time of the year where we stop and reflect. Where are we going? What are we doing? What is my New Year's resolution? I stopped making those a long time ago because I would last about two weeks and then I would fail epically. So I stopped doing that. But we as human beings have this natural tendency to want to stop and reflect and say, where are we going? What are we doing with ourselves? And January 1st gives us that opportunity to do that. One of the things that we need to stop and understand is who we are. What are we all about? And as we reflect on that and we make our resolutions, sometimes we need to say, what is our identity? In youth group, we spent several weeks talking about identity, and we talked about how God wants us to look at ourselves and how society looks or tells us to look upon ourselves. And very often, those were two very different streets of thought. The world has its own ideas, whereas God has had his ideas for thousands of years. And it was neat to watch as the kids, and even myself as we reflected on it, to see who we are and what's that truth that we need to base ourselves in, in God, and how it can be so easy to get confused and lost if you don't have that to build off of. And each of us have to decide for ourselves, who are we going to be in this life? Who are we following? What do we believe? Do we have a foundation of truth or just whatever our feelings tell us? What am I really doing with myself? And we have to stop and answer those questions, and we have to make sure that our answers are consistent, because if we don't have something to base ourselves on, we're kind of just out in the wind, floating around, going nowhere, having no direction. And ironically, Jesus does address this. We were supposed to look to the Bible for answers, and God said, hey, I'm going to give you an answer to this. So in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus and his disciples were going through, uh, they were on their way to Caesarea Philippi. And I said that specifically for Adam because he always stumbles over that. And I like to bug him about that one. So, But anyway, so they're having a conversation and we kind of get dropped into the middle of this conversation because it seems like out of nowhere Jesus asks this question, who do people say I am? Kind of a random thing, right? Now, obviously we don't have the rest of the context of the conversation, so maybe it fit in perfectly. But it's a great question. Who do people say I am? Now, Jesus was asking the guys, he's like, okay, what's the word on the street? What's the scuttlebutt? What's everybody say? Who, who am I? Who am I? And Jesus was such a dynamic figure and so different at the time that people had a hard time putting into words who he was. Some people thought maybe he was Elijah who had come back because Elijah had never died, right? And so maybe he had come back in this form. Maybe he was in one of the other prophets like Jeremiah or Isaiah, Maybe he was just a really good rabbi or teacher because people saw him that way. And there were some people that even thought that maybe he was John the Baptist who had come back because at this point John had his head cut off. And so they're going through all of these and they're good answers. But then Jesus turns the question a little bit more and makes it very personal. Who do you say I am? Now, while he was asking that to the disciples, it's a very important question for us. Because I can only imagine the, the disciples were probably like, oh, well, the people are saying this, but now he's forcing them to think about it. Who am I? Who am I to you? We've had this relationship for a couple years now. Who do you think I am? And I'm sure many of them probably were like, well, I mean, he is a good teacher, and maybe, maybe he is just, you know, maybe he is Elijah once again. After seeing all the miracles and the healings and the way that he dealt with people, it was so different. But then Peter, Simon at the time, stopped and had the revelation through the Holy Spirit and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
that statement in and of itself is very profound and nothing we should take lightly. The truth that Peter spoke came directly from God. And it's not to say that Peter maybe had started to put the pieces together, but the Holy Spirit definitely was in him and gave him this revelation. All of the marvelous things that we just spent time talking about at Christmas time, all the things that the angels proclaimed to the shepherds and what the wise men had seen and all of the Christmas story is in this statement. It's funny because as children, when we went to Sunday school, you hear all of these stories. You know, we talk about it, and I always go back to flannel graph because that's the one thing that always stands out in my mind. But, um, you know, all the stories that you see at Christmas time with little baby Jesus in the manger and um, the wise men and the shepherds and all that stuff, this was the embodiment of it. This is what Jesus was all about. And Jesus made this statement to Peter afterwards. He said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he also goes on to say, and I also say this to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall never prevail against it. Jesus was telling Peter that I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to build my church around you and all of these guys. This was a new movement, something different, a new way to look at the relationship. Remember, God, had been, God is trying to always repair the relationship between us fallen human beings and himself. He's always wanted that. That's how much he loves us. And so by having Jesus proclaim this and saying that I'm going to do something different, I'm going to build something different, I'm going to build a new movement. And so what we can do is when we as Christians, look at our identity, we can say that we are in Jesus Christ and on us he builds the church. Now, I am not a construction person, but I do know a little bit about when buildings, and when, back in the day when they would go and build these huge stone structures, what they would do is they'd take out a bunch of stones, and they'd carve them up, and then the engineers and the architects would look at them, and they would pick one. And that would be the stone everything was built around. And that's where we get the term cornerstone. And so when everything was built off of this cornerstone, everything would line up. So they'd put that one down, and they'd level it and measure it, and then all of the other stones around it were built. And the foundation was laid, and then everything else was built from that. And that's what this declaration from Jesus was all about. Yes, Simon was now Peter. He was the rock on which he's building the church. But it was also where the Messiah was going to be spread out to the rest of the world. Jesus took all of the things that he did as teaching moments, whether it was through the parables or through the miracles, or again, the interactions with all of the people. And he was chiseling each one of them into the person that they were going to be as the foundation of the church. So that when they would go out after his death and resurrection, each one of them was an important part of the church and is a reason why all of us are here and why people are gathering all around the world in the name of Christ. And we see this evidence because the church did start. If you go and look at the story of the day of Pentecost, all these guys, these 12, 11 guys were going out and they were talking and they're speaking in tongues. And everybody's like, um, what's up with these guys? They're simple fishermen and tax collectors and they're speaking in my language. This is really weird. But Peter stopped and made this whole speech and it's a wonderful speech about how Christ was this new way, this new movement. And 3,000 people on that day accepted Christ and that's how the church got started. It's an amazing thing. Now, there's a really cool word that I got to learn while I was putting this message together about as we gather as a group, okay? So we're going to learn, and I believe this is a Latin word. I'm looking to him because he's the one that showed it to me. Can you go ahead? It is. Thank you, Spencer. Ecclesia. So ecclesia means a gathering or an assembly of people for a common identity or purpose. Okay? Now, it's not an exclusive church word like some of the words that we come across because, honestly, if you go down to Heinz Field, 
That's an ecclesia of crazy Steeler fans, right? Or if you go over to the Elks Club or you go to any place, it, it applies to anything. But the important part of this is, is that whatever the group is, they have a common purpose and they have a common vision. And so this early church was this ecclesia that came together and they started meeting for four reasons. They wanted to learn more about Christ and the apostles were pouring themselves out and letting the Holy Spirit speak through them. They were doing breaking of bread. They were making sure that they were remembering the Lord's Supper. They were praying with one another, and they were taking care of everybody. If somebody had a need, they could bring it, and they would take care of it. They would sell property, or they would sell whatever they have to make sure that everybody had what they needed. And that was their vision, though, based on those four things. And for years, what would happen is the disciples would never meet. They never came to a place like this. They would always go to a house meeting or a small group. So they would meet in these small groups, and for hundreds of years, this is how they met and came together. And then in the early two to three hundreds is when they first documented the actual building being built. And ironically, about that time when they started building these buildings, the word church stopped being associated with the people and started becoming associated with the building. And so, Interestingly enough, as that became the case, the focus of the church stopped being about the people and more about the building. Now, I'm going to pause right here. I actually have it later on, but I'm going to pause right here. Anything I say about the church building is not meant to be derogatory. It is not meant to be an insult. I know that this place is a wonderful place. It's beautiful. I love it. But what I'm going to say is important for us to understand about us as people. Okay. So as the church became more about the building, it became more about what was happening inside of the building. And it became more important about the building. And whoever was in control of the building kind of controlled what was happening. Now, that was still true in the small meetings where people were talking and they kind of controlled it, but it was more focused on Christ. And as this continued to grow and grow and grow, we had to be careful because during the Middle Ages, I don't know if you all knew this, but they would have giant Bibles and the people, or the church was the only one that had the Bible. It wasn't out to the people yet. But the Bible was so important, so in control, that they would put it on the pulpit and they would chain it to the pulpit so that nobody would take it. The control was, we have the book, we're going to tell you what's going to happen. When you come in these doors, we are going to tell you what to do. And so it was through God that the gospel doesn't ever get quenched. Okay, it doesn't ever stop. And God came along and he raised up a person named Martin Luther. I'm sure you guys have all heard that name, right? So Martin Luther came along and he had these amazing theses that he nailed to the door of, the church, of a church that he was working at and said, this is not the way it is going to be. We need to reform the church. We need to get back to what it was. And so the Reformation started. But there was another gentleman that was very instrumental in making sure that the movement of the church became back about the people and not just about the building, and his name is William Tyndale. Now, if you've never heard that name, if you pick up your Bible, you've probably seen his name on the Bible. William Tyndale was the gentleman who said, the Bible should be for the people, and the people need to know about God. And so what he did is he took a Bible, and he had to smuggle it away from the church, get it to a guy named Gutenberg. You may have heard of him. And his printing press. And he started printing Bibles, and he would take these Bibles, and he'd smuggle them in to different people, and he'd give them away because he felt that the people needed to have the word of God. He was hunted down by the church leaders. He was tied to a stake 
he was strangled, and he was burned for passing out the word of God by the church leaders. Again, you can try to control God, but you cannot control God. How in the world did the church go from a movement of people going out and doing the teachings of Christ to a building that was under control? And the answer is, people are greedy. People want to be in control. But, thankfully, God's plan is always bigger than that. And we can't stop God's plan. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, it happens in Acts chapter 5. So, by this point, the disciples have been arrested and beaten a couple of times for preaching this new way, this gospel. And the Jewish church leaders, just they, they're so upset. They're like, this is not the way it's supposed to be. And so one of these times that they bring them in and arrest them and they talk very harshly to them, they're like, what are we going to do? How are we going to stop these guys? A very wise rabbi, Pharisee, stood up and his name was Gamaliel. And he gives this small speech talking about the history of rebels in Israel that they've dealt with and all of these different things. But at the end of his speech, he says something very profound. He says, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if their plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you have even been found to fight against God. The gospel of Jesus Christ was a vision that did not come from a mere man. It came from the living Son of God, as Peter declared. It came directly to him, and it went directly to the people. It was the movement. It was the start of that rebuilding of that relationship. Everything that Jesus did was centered around what he could do for the people. Now, I, like I said, I'm not trying to diss anything. But I feel that like during the pandemic, we had this feeling that when we had to shut the church building down, that things were going to die. That was just my feeling. I don't know how anybody else felt. But I feel that we felt that the building was closed and so nothing could happen. But there were plenty of people that stepped up and did amazing things. Yes, we couldn't have contact with people, but yet we fed hundreds of people. Yes, we couldn't go out and meet as we normally could, but we had a dedicated group that came every Sunday. And we did praise and we did worship and we did our absolute best to get it out to the people across the internet. We had people that would go and they would make phone calls and they were checking on people to make sure that everybody was okay and if they had needs, how could we help you? The building was closed. The church was more active than ever. And it was awesome. And God did amazing things through that time. And God even set us up, I believe, with our small groups. When we got to come back together, one of our big emphases is was getting together, meeting, and building small groups. And it was important because it helped us. It helped us see that we could still reconnect with people, that we could meet with one another, we could bring our concerns to one another, we could learn from one another, we could grow with one another. We could do it corporately like this, but we could be more intimate, just like those home churches were when it first started out. Now, I, again, I love this building, but have you ever stopped and looked what it looks like on the outside? It's beautiful, right? Stones, stained glass, the doors out front, I love that old wood. But have you ever stopped to think what it's like for somebody in the community who's never been inside of a church, or what it looks like? I'm sure for some people it probably looks very intimidating, almost like a castle, For some people, I'm sure, like the UPS driver, 
which set of doors do you come in to get to where you need to make a delivery? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, there's a lot of doors. And if you've never stepped inside of a church, it can be intimidating because you don't know what's inside. And that's not a diss on any of us. I feel that we're very friendly to people that walk through our doors, but sometimes it's tough just to get people through the doors, right? So what does that mean for us? I'm going to ask the tough question. What kind of church are we? And I had to stop and think about what kind of churches are there? Now, we have different denominations and everything like that. But I'm more talking about what is our perception to the community. Are we a country club church? Do we only worry about ourselves? Do we only worry about our image? Are we scared to have somebody walk through the door that doesn't dress right or doesn't act right or doesn't know what's going on? I think that for a little bit of time here in the United States, that was the attitude of the church. It was a club. It was the social place to go. I go to this church. Oh, well, I go to this church. Oh, no, I go to this church. It's just the way it was. So what kind of church are we as LUMC? I feel that as LUMC, we strive to reach out to the community. We have people in our congregation who are amazing at working with our older folks in the congregation. We have folks who are amazing and want to go out and reach the world, whether it's across the street, down the road, or out of the country. We have people that are always asking, what else can we do to help? What else can we do to make sure that we are serving the needs of the people? Now, for the last several months since Pastor Chris has come on board, we've spent a lot of time talking about our mission statement. And if you're not sure what our mission statement is, it's on the bulletin. I'll move this. Front of the bulletin. It says that our vision and our mission at LUMC is making maturing, mobilizing, and multiplying disciples of Jesus Christ in our community and beyond. And it's funny because in all of the meetings that I've sat in through church council and through SPRC and other things that we've done, we talk a lot about that. What are we doing? What are we going out? How are we making this a part of our lives? How are we making this everything that we need to do? And it's important. We need to step back and take a look at what we're doing. There's a lot of times where we do stuff, but do we do stuff just to do stuff? Or are we doing things to make sure that we're reflecting this? And this topic's going to get vetted out a lot more over the next several weeks. Talking about putting these words of action into action, as it were. That's why everything that we do has become so important. Do we need to continue to feed our community? Do we need to continue to be that place that's a triage center for the people that are hurting, for the people that are lost, for the people that are searching? That's why it's important to be part of a small group so that you can plug in and you can start growing with others, so that you can start learning and start having those connections. So as I wrap up here, I want to talk about what the title of my sermon is. Are we about our Father's business? Now, this is, comes from the story of Jesus when he was a young boy. He and his parents and their whole family had gone into Jerusalem for the Passover, and they went and they celebrated, and as they're coming home, Mary and Joseph are like, Where, where's Jesus? Now, you know, modern society are like, how do you lose your child? But remember, they were traveling in a caravan of people, so Jesus could have been anywhere. It's a simple question, right? But it took them three days to find him back in Jerusalem. And as a parent, I was thinking, man, I would be so flipping out. I would be so just beside myself. Where is my child? 
And I have to imagine that when they walked into the temple and they saw Jesus, and he's sitting there with the other uh, Pharisees and rabbis, man, as a parent, I would have walked in there and started laying him a new one, right? But I think that when Mary and Joseph walked in and they heard what Jesus was saying, and they saw that he was talking to the rabbis and talking to these Pharisees as someone who knew something, and it just caused them to pause and stop and look at him. Now, Mary still was mad. She's like, what are you doing, Jesus? You had me so worried for three days. And all Jesus said was, why are you so worried? You know I have to be about my father's business. Jesus knew his purpose there, there and then. But it's a great question for us to stop and think about. If we are in Christ, as we say that we are, if we are following him, are we going about our Father's business? Now, Jesus unpacked all of this during his ministry, of course. He'd go out to the people and take care of their needs. And he set the example for us to follow. He gave us all of the tools that we need to go out and what we need to do so that we can put our mission and our vision into action. Being about our Father's business is going out and making disciples of people. Our Father's business is going out into the community and seeing what those needs are. Clothing, food, an ear, a shoulder. We can be the hands and feet of Christ in many, many ways. We don't go out and do things just so people can say, oh, hey, that church up the street, they're very generous. They're loving, they're kind. It's great to have that reputation, but it's not what we rest on. We need to go out and make, mature, mobilize, and multiply. We need to make sure that people see that we genuinely care about them. We need to reflect Christ, the one who gave us his grace and his mercy and his love so that everybody else can see that as well. We want to show the people that we're all in on what we believe, the gospel that brought us to him. We want to show them that God is not a passive entity. God doesn't just sit back and, oh, sucks to be you, this happened to you. Oh, you know, okay, you're praying, whatever. God is an act of loving God. God is somebody that wants a relationship and is actively seeking that out with each and every one of us. And today, we get to celebrate that. Today, we're going to partake in communion. Remember, when the disciples got together, they would pray, they would learn about Christ, they would help each other, and they would remember what Jesus did for each and every one of us. thought of the word communion. The root of that is, is commune. Another word that comes is, is related is the word community. Sometimes people, as they follow Jesus, lose sight of the fact that we are not individuals. We are not merely individuals. Our faith requires a personal decision, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that it's private. And as we share in the sacrament of Holy Communion, it is a reminder that each and every one of us as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are part of something bigger. 
that we share in the body and the blood of Christ. And as Travis has said to us, we share in his mission, we being the hands and the feet of Jesus. And as we receive uh, the sacrament, we are reminded that we are part of the body of Christ. And Jesus invites everyone to be part of that. He invites all of us to share this morning, and, and Christ invites everybody to his table who love him, everybody who earnestly repents of their sin, and everybody who, who desires to live in peace with one another. It's not a United Methodist communion. It's a gift of Jesus to all who come to him with repentance, desiring to grow, to grow closer to him. We remember how on the night that he was betrayed, he gave himself up for us, that he took bread, he broke it, gave thanks to his father and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Take, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to to his father, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for the incredible gift of yourself. We thank you, God, for the way you invite us to be a part of that. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us who are gathered here. And on these, your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us, God the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ. Help us to love Christ and love each other and love the world until Jesus, until you come in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We just came through a time of sharing with our families, and many of us had family dinners, and some of us didn't like everything that happened at all of our family dinners. Amen? I wish we didn't have to take communion in this way, but it's a reminder to us that Jesus comes to us in many forms, in many different ways. And what's incredibly important is not necessarily the particular method, but what's important is what happens in your heart, in my heart, as we remember who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So please take off the top uh, and get the wafer. Representing the body of Christ, take and eat and be thankful for his sacrifice. And then the cup. Take and drink and remember his blood that was shed for you. Take and drink and be thankful. Lord God, we're incredibly grateful that you invite us to be part of all that you're doing. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice for us, for your your love that continues to reach to us. In your holy name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Please stand as we sing. 